Our text this morning is Mark chapter 6, verses 33 through the end of the chapter. These are the words of God. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred pennyworth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and brake the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and he saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened." And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those who were sick where they heard, where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Let's pray. Father, would you by your spirit and through this living and abiding word cause your people to see and behold the great glory of Jesus. Apart from him, we are blind, deaf, mute, and crippled. And so by the power of Jesus, raise us up, loose our tongues, open our eyes and ears, and make us whole. Do this through the ministry of the preaching of your word and by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you recall from last week, Mark has just told us of a king serving the head of a righteous man on a feasting dish at a royal banquet, right? If you recall from last week, we noted how um, Herod is is, um, terrified of the news of Jesus sending out his disciples into all of Israel um, with signs following them, with driving out the demons and healing the sick and preaching a message of repentance um, and and pointing to um, a sign of judgment upon any city that wouldn't receive uh, the message of repentance and believe the signs of, of demons being cast out and the sick being healed. And that, that reality terrified Herod, and he assumed there must have been some sort of resurrection. John, whom he'd beheaded, must have been resurrected. This is his conclusion. And, and we're told that through the conniving of Herodias, his wife, um, she conspires to... Um, entice Herod to behead John the Baptist and to, and to serve his head on a, on, a, on a feasting dish. And so we've just seen Herod, the king of, of, the, the king of Israel, um, serving the head of a righteous man upon a, on a platter at a royal banquet, at his birthday banquet. And that is set in contrast, uh, that king is set in contrast with a different kind of king, the, the true king of Israel who brings his people into green pastures and besides still waters to give them an abundant feast. 
The contrast really could not be more stark. If you recall, I mentioned last week that Herod really desired the legitimacy of the, of the Jews. He wanted to be viewed as their lawful king. Um, and, and it's quite striking that um, he's curious about, we're told that he was curious about John the Baptist. The fact that John the Baptist was gathering such crowds unto him and the people pun intended, were flocking to John the Baptist. They had been a sheep without a shepherd. And John the Baptist arises, and the people flock to hear him, come to hear this message of repentance and the baptism of, and receive the baptism of repentance. And Herod, we're told, would go out and listen or, or, or get, send messengers to tell him what this, this message of John the Baptist was. He was intrigued by it, we're told earlier in chapter 6 here. And instead of hearing and heeding and submitting to this message, and instead of being a righteous king, as he ought to have been, he instead begins to devour, as it were, the, the righteous shepherd, to, to serve the righteous shepherd as a feast. And instead of being a righteous king, he's a wicked king, haunted by the prospect of the resurrection. And so now Mark sets in contrast to that a, a true king, the, the lawful king, the king who is returning out of exile uh, to feed his people, to be a shepherd to his people. So what I want to do is work through this text at sort of a 30,000 foot level. And then what I want to do, this, this passage that we're looking at today is really nicely divided into three separate um, quick moving episodes, which is, we've noted before, sort of Mark's uh, signature, uh, it's his trademark to move quickly through each episode. And so we will do much the same. I want to look at them from a 30,000 foot level and then look at each of these episodes in a bit more detail and with some application behind them. So first, let's uh, go through the text. The disciples, as I just mentioned, have returned from their miniature uh, Great Commission. It's a, it's a, a foreshadowing of the Great Commission. Um, and and they've, they've gone into all of Israel preaching the gospel, preaching uh, repentance, calling Israel to repentance, driving out demons, healing the sick. And if you recall, if a city didn't receive that message, uh, the disciples were to dust off the, the sand from off their feet as a sign of condemnation and judgment being brought upon the city who wouldn't receive this word that was being sown. The disciples return to Jesus, and it's the 12 disciples plus 70 other disciples. So again, you can imagine 82 uh, people trying to recount all that had happened and taken place and breathlessly trying to recount, oh, Jesus, we did this, and look, uh, all, all stumbling over, tripping over each other's words and trying to get uh, their, their story um, uh, in. And Jesus says, let's take a breather and go across the Galilee waters for reprieve, it would seem. Uh, initially, it looks like they're going on some sort of wilderness retreat to get a breath and rest and be re refreshed uh, in a private place, we're told in uh, verses 30 through 32. Uh, the, the word private there literally means wilderness. It's a, a wilderness a refuge that they're going to, to get away from the crowds. But the multitudes will not be left behind. They see Jesus crossing the, the, the Sea of Galilee, and they will, they're not, <laughs> you're not going to get away from us. Uh, we've, we've noted that Jesus' ministry has started a, a little bit small, but it's growing in, in number as the seed is going out and is, and is beginning to produce a harvest. And so you can imagine the, the, the visual of people uh, when Jesus sets out on the sea and crosses over and they, maybe they catch a snatch of, of um, one of the disciples uh, speaking about where they're, they're planning to land and word begins to spread, and you can imagine that there's this snowball effect along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee of a multitude saying, Jesus is heading to the other side of the lake, and imagining, we're told later, 5,000 people, at least 5,000 men, likely more with women and children, a snowball effect of a multitude racing around the, the, the Sea of Galilee to catch up with Jesus when he lands on the other side. And so when Jesus uh, goes to, arrives on the other side, he's immediately met with this great multitude. The, the reprieve or the rest that had been envisioned is instead uh, the, the work of revival continues. It, it's not to be uh, broken. And so when Jesus gets to the other side, ta-da, there's a great multitude. Uh, verses 30, 33 and 34. Jesus, we're told, in contrast again to Herod, takes uh, compassion upon this shepherdless flock. And his compassion, it's worth noting here, is demonstrated by his teaching them. So he takes compassion upon them, and this is really important in our modern 
age of um, self-care and self-love and speak your own truth and, and, and um, uh, believe in yourself, all the mantras that we hear around us, it's, it's important to note that Jesus' compassion is embodied in his teaching. His teaching them the word. And so our compassion upon um, shepherdless souls, wandering souls, wandering sheep, should not be divorced from the word. It should not be divorced from the teachings of scripture. It's not to soothe and let people speak their truth. Rather, it is to, to, show, to show true compassion than Jesus shows it for us. Uh, It's demonstrated in his teaching of them, him giving them the word before he gives them uh, the bread. He meets their spiritual need before meeting their, their earthly need. Verse 34, as dusk begins to descend and the disciples advise Jesus uh, to send the multitudes away to get their own food, they say we're in a desert place. We don't want to be responsible for all these people starving. Uh, So send them away now so they can get to the towns and villages and find bread for themselves uh, there in verses 35 and 36. But if you recall, Jesus has already, has previously stated back in chapter 2, he stated, I've come to feast. He's come to feast with tax collectors and sinners even. If you remember back in chapter 2, that was one of the first controversies that Jesus had with the Pharisees was he calls Levi and then Levi invites him to his home to feast and the, the Pharisees are scandalized by the fact that he would feast with sinners and tax collectors and, and prostitutes. He's, they're scandalized by it, but Jesus tells them, I've come to feast with such. I've come to, and just like Yahweh in the Old Testament, Yahweh feasted with a sinful nation of Israel. Yahweh has always come to feast with sinners and that he might fill them and feed them and change them. And so he's he's already told them he's come to feast, so he's not going to send the crowd away. He tells the disciples instead, you go get bread for them all. And they demonstrate the smallness of their faith by missing the point entirely. They imagine that they must produce some vast sum of money to purchase enough bread, verse 37. But Jesus is not deterred by the amount needed. If they had been tracking, they would have remembered this is a callback to the parable that he had already told them. He is the sower of the word, and where the soil is fertile, it will be a 30, 60, and 100-fold harvest. He's told them that where the word goes forth, it will bring forth an abundant harvest. Where it's received with gladness, it will bear a great harvest. And here before them is this great multitude who's heard and receiving the word. It's this great host of harvest, and, and they're with the one who can make the, make the grass, causes the grass to grow, as we heard earlier in one of the scripture readings. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle of the earth. He asks them how much bread they have, and they tell him, they report back, they have five loaves and two, and two fishes, a loaf for each thousand. There are, um, back in um, the early church fathers have plenty of speculation as, in their allegorical method, plenty of speculation as to what the five loaves and the two fish represent. Some would say it's the five books of the Pentateuch um, and the two fish represent the, the wisdom literature and the prophetic literature. Uh, but I would, I would make the case that what's in view here is, is effectively a loaf for each thousand, as we're told. It's a, it's a crowd of 5,000 men. And I, I think it's to, to help us to see that these loaves are like seeds uh, able to feed a, a, a great host, a thousandfold harvest, verses 38 and 44. Jesus commands the disciples to arrange the multitude into ranks. Mark uses military terminology to divide the, this multitude up into, uh, again, martial language, uh, into ranks of hundreds and fifties upon the green springtime grass, verses 39 and 40. And that reference might seem like a, a a little bit of a throwaway line about the green grass, but it actually helps us um, to place the timing of, of what time of year this is. Um, in the early spring, the grass would be green, and then by uh, late summer, it's all turned, uh, it's been burned up or it's been harvested, whatnot. Um, and so this gives us a, a time stamp that it would be springtime, which is when Passover would take place. And so Mark is giving us a prefiguring of events that are yet to come, the events of Christ's Last Supper, which also took place at, uh, around Passover. And, and the, the language that's used in Jesus' blessing and breaking and giving of the bread maps onto the later Last Supper. So Mark is giving us a glimpse. It's a, bread, a bunch of breadcrumbs, hints, uh, pointing us to glories that are yet to come. 
uh, here in, in, this, in this act of blessing, breaking, and then giving, multiplying the bread to all this great crowd. Verse 41. The multitude of 5,000 men, they feast until they're filled, and we're told that there, there is plenty left over. There's leftovers that fill 12 baskets, one for each disciple, it would seem. But Mark, in his signature fashion, doesn't stop and pause and let us consider these events. He whisks us off on the next episode. He whisks us off for one more, uh, for one more scene in this story, this great drama of Christ's earthly ministry. And straightway, remember that's the, that's the key word throughout Mark's gospel, straightway Jesus instructs the disciples to cross the sea while he dismisses, gives the benediction to the crowd and sends them home. And then Jesus heads off alone to pray. Now, again, another hint at the events of his passion. All will forsake him and he will be left alone in the garden of Gethsemane to pray. Verses 45 through 46. But while still on the land, he sees the disciples battling the choppy Galilee the Galilee Sea, uh, and we're told at the darkest hour of the night. Mark, Mark does something pretty spectacular here. He paints Jesus, he shows that Jesus well, is still on the land, and at the fourth hour of the night, the fourth watch of the night, which is between like three to six in the morning, so the darkest hour of the night, according to Roman uh, reckoning, the Roman watches, Jesus sees them battling the wind, battling the waves um, from the shoreline. So he's, um, he's, he's not... Um, left his care of them. He's watching over them. And he then sees their struggles and he walks out to their rescue. One of the greatest episodes in Jesus' life. One of the most memorable episodes of Jesus walking out upon the water. Verses 47 through 48. This is the second time, though, that the disciples have battled the wind and the waves upon the, the sea. And in the first instance, Jesus was asleep in the boat. And they wake him up and say, help us, help us. We're about to die. Don't you care? We're about to perish. And Jesus, of course, rebukes their lack of faith and then stills the, the, the raging sea. And they're filled with wonder. And this is the second time now that they're caught in the midst of the raging sea. And Jesus comes to them. And instead of being grateful and receiving him gladly and feeling relief and reassurance, we're told that they're terrified. And, and, and he's, Jesus is about to pass them because they don't hail him and say, yeah, come, come into our boat, rescue us once more. Instead, they see him as if he's a death angel, a spirit. And so he and his compassion once more comes into their ship with tidings of good cheer. Here they are battling the wind and the waves in the darkest hour of the night, and he says, be of good cheer, it's I, fear not. And he comes up into their boat, and at his coming, the adversarial winds cease, verses 49 and 50 through 51. The disciples are left in slack-jawed awe once more, and Mark tells us why. Mark inserts a comment here about why the disciples are so in awe, so stunned by this great miracle of the Lord. He says they're in awe because they didn't learn the lesson of the loaves. They didn't learn the lesson of the loaves, and this left them stunned. As They have the basket, they have the 12 baskets of leftovers there in the boat with them, and they're shocked that Jesus stills the wind and the waves. They have not learned the lesson of the loaves, we're told. This is, Mark tells us why they're uh, in awe. It's because they still hadn't learned the lesson that Jesus has been patiently teaching them over and over again in a number of ways. Uh, this parable of the sower and now in the feeding of the 5,000. In the parable of the sower, he tells them um, that when the sower goes out to sow the seed, um, when it finds good soil, it will bring forth this great harvest. And then after that parable, remember, they sail out into the ocean, into the sea once more and face the great storm. A similar thing has happened. He has sown uh, the loaves and now fed a multitude. And now they're on the stormy sea again. And they don't see that this before them in their presence is Messiah, who is Lord of heaven and earth, sea and land, the sower and the sea captain. Verses 51 through 52. And then as they come ashore once more, this time in the area of Gennesaret, which is like northwest, uh, the northwestern part of um, the Sea of Galilee, once again, Mark gives us the key word. He's whisking us off to another scene. Jesus' identity is straightway recognized. He's immediately recognized, and there's a, like wildfire, the word of Jesus' is coming begins to, begins to spread all around. Jesus has been healing people throughout 
the, last, the, the, the first six chapters of Mark. We know that there's been various healings, and Mark has zoomed in on some of them and lingered on some of them, um, given us more or less details with various stories or just reported that he healed people in that town. But in this instance, it would seem that the, the news of his coming and of his healing power is beginning to rush around like wildfire. People rush to bring their sick unto him for healing. Whenever they hear that Jesus is coming to a certain town, word spreads in the surrounding regions to bring the sick to Jesus. And it, and it even references here that in the, basically in the marketplaces, the marketplaces are being overrun. When news comes that Jesus is coming to that town, uh, the, uh, the people begin to overrun. The sick people are brought and they overrun the marketplace with sick people hoping to be healed. The marketplaces turn into hospitals in the middle of the towns and villages where they heard Jesus was heading. And it's clear that the story of what had happened to the, to the woman with the 12 years of internal bleeding had become clearly, had clearly become widely known. Uh, the, the news had got around because here we're told that the, the rumor was that if you could just touch the tassels or the, the hem of Christ's garment, he would bring healing, that they would be healed. And this, in fact, is precisely what Jesus allows. Jesus, Mark, Mark tells us that Jesus, as he would go through these towns, all these makeshift triage centers, these hospitals that replaced the grocery stores in the middle of town, were, were full of sick people. And whoever touched Jesus, who, all who touched him, in Mark's wonderful words, were made whole. Jesus sweeping through the land of Israel and all who touched him, who were afflicted with various sicknesses, were made whole. So again, I want to look at each of these episodes in a bit more detail. Mark's narrative, as we've noted before, is like an incoming tide. Each new wave brings the water level a little bit higher. He's given us hints here and there, but each time that the cycle repeats, the, the water level gets higher. The intensity ramps up. The glory gets brighter. Um, it, it's, it's often, uh, it should be noted that um, in the early, uh, in the first century, it wasn't like you could print off the Gospel of Mark and, and, and print off a, a million copies of it to hand it around. It would be read in the hearing of, of, a, gather, of a gathering like this. It would be read in the church or read in a setting, and, and the, the scroll would be passed around. Um, and so this narrative device of cycling through similar, um, similar events um, helped help the hearers to remember and recall with greater and greater intensity. It's a helpful, um, uh, a helpful way to remember the story for an oral-based society. And that's no, no accident here. Mark is wanting the intensity and the repetition uh, to expand in greater and greater uh, waves of glory. There's a repetition and an expansion of earlier events in, here in our text, but there's also this anticipation of yet-to-be-revealed glories. Mark has told us a number of times of people responding to Jesus with awe and wonder, fear, bafflement, and even terror. In other words, in all these retellings, in all these recapitulations, in all these cycles, what Mark is doing in telling us about Jesus, Mark doesn't want you to get comfortable with a Jesus that can fit in the palm of your hand. Just when you think you've got him figured out, he, he expands the glory. It's it would seem like, yes, we've heard this story before about the sower sowing seed, but now it comes and the seed is, is planted and harvested and distributed to 5,000 in a matter of an evening. This, this Jesus is getting out of hand. We, we can't keep him in our pockets anymore. We can't tuck him under the bed and, and, and ignore him anymore. Mark doesn't want you to get comfortable with a Jesus that can fit in the palm of your hand. He is leading up to the crescendo where Jesus will lead out his disciples into all the world. As the kids say, this is a bit of a spoiler alert, but if we go to the, the end of Mark's gospel, we're given a glimpse of what Mark is leading up to, this great crescendo that Mark is leading up to. We know, of course, that Christ will ascend to the Father's right hand. We read in verse 19 of chapter 16. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, Jesus is referred to now as the Lord, the, the Messiah, the King, the uh, Yahweh in the flesh over Israel. After he had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Jesus, the Messiah, has now departed to go sit on, upon his throne at the Father's right hand. And we, we would make a grievous mistake if we think that Jesus is dusting off his hands and that his work now is done. 
the, the, the work that's been going on and slowly growing and with each wave coming up higher with more glory as if Jesus' work was done. No, we're told that the waves keep crashing. And they, the disciples, went forth and preached where? Everywhere. The disciples are sent out and they preach this good news everywhere. He's ascended the Father's right hand. It's not the termination of his work in the world. Mark tells us that as the disciples went forth and preached everywhere, it's not just the disciples by themselves. It says this, the Lord working with them. Jesus is still at work in the midst of his people. Jesus is still at work bringing the good news of his life, death, and resurrection, the glory that is revealed in him. The, the forgiveness of sins that is found in him, the, 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 the healing that is found in him is going now into all the world. And Jesus is working with his people, with his disciples, and confirming the word with signs following. And Mark closes, amen. The word goes forth everywhere. Jesus is not done with his work. Lest you think you can fit him into the palm of your hand and tuck him away in a closet, he will not be contained there. The work which Jesus has come to do is for every inch of this planet. It's meant for every corner of this globe. Jesus told us that he was the sower of the word and that where the seed of his word lands in good, receptive soil, it produces a graciously abundant harvest of bread in seed form. That story, of course, was followed by Jesus crossing the waters to cast a demon army into the sea, a callback to the Hebrews' Red Sea crossing under Moses and the casting of the Egyptians into the sea. Here, Jesus takes his disciples through the sea again, but this time a multitude of Israelites follow him. Mark wants us to keep the Red Sea imagery, the Exodus imagery in mind, but this time it's going to be a little bit different of an emphasis, where in the first crossing it was to go cast this demon army like the Egyptians into the sea. This time we're to see real clear notes or to hear real clear notes of the Exodus story, the multitudes of Israel marching out of Egypt to the promised land. One, Mark wants the Exodus story on our mind. One commentary notes that when God led Israel out of Egypt by the way of the Red Sea, they went, in the King James it says, they went up harnessed, Exodus 13, 18. In the Hebrew, that'd be literally by rows of five. So you've got these, the Exodus story is marked by rows of five, men marching out in, in ranks of five. At Jethro's council, Moses constituted the 12 tribes of Israel into representative divisions of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, Exodus 18.25. And then when Israel was in the wilderness, of course, Yahweh fed them bread from heaven. From heaven. They, they needed food, they were hungry, and God sends them manna from heaven. All of that, all those components of the Exodus story are... Um, Mark is wanting those to be in our mind as we see this picture of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Uh, the, the setting of the, the multitude in ranks of hundreds and fifties is this callback to Moses uh, under Jethro's council constituting um, Israel into 12 uh, representative divisions with the thousands, hundreds and fifties. The rows of five uh, help us to see the reasoning for the, five, the number of 5,000. And just like the disciples struggled with the parable of the sower, Jesus now retells it in order to help them understand it, in order to, to depict it as a visual demonstration this time. He is the Son of God, revealing God unto the sons of men. In Him, in Messiah, in this one who has come in the name of the Lord, in this one who is before whom the way is being made straight for Yahweh's conquest of His people and of all the earth, in Him is life abundant. Jesus sows five loaves, uh, seed, loaf seeds and it becomes a thousandfold harvest of bread. In him is bread and plenty for a cleansed Israel. Notice that in the first few chapters of Mark, Mark is focused on Jesus calling and then cleansing Israel. He would call disciples followed by a series of miracles. Now that was sort of the cycle that Mark has gone through in these early chapters, calling the disciples and then cleansing Israelites through casting out of demons and healing the sick. But now a theme is beginning to emerge, which started earlier on almost imperceptibly. 
but it's now too big to ignore. Remember when Jesus, one of Jesus' first healings, he heals Simon Peter's mother, and he heals her. She's sick with the fever, and he heals her, and what does he tell her to do? Go make a meal. Go, go feed the, this smaller group of disciples. Jesus heals in order to feast. Jesus restores her that, in order that there might be a feast to be shared together. This almost imperceptible theme began early on, but now it's too big to ignore. He has gone through cleansing the, the, uh, the lepers, driving out a legion of demons, restoring the, uh, Jairus' daughter from death to life, uh, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, her 12 years of suffering being stanched and relieved, and now a great multitude is following in his train. This sower is reaping his harvest. It's now too big to ignore. And these 12 leftover baskets make the same point as the parable of the sower. But the disciples still don't quite see it. Jesus came to feast with a cleansed Israel. Jesus came to feast with a cleansed Israel. Notice that when, where he comes, he comes to bring his word and that in abundance. He didn't come to, uh, to just give a, a, a pinch of satisfaction, uh, to, to give just a little bit of reprieve, to, to, hang, to dangle a carrot in front of us in hopes that there might be forgiveness and restoration, in hopes that we might be made whole. No, in him is enough and sufficient to feed a multitude and that there will be leftovers. It's not as if um, in, in, the, in these matters of God's great grace towards the sons of man, as if as if it's a potluck line and you're at the back of it and you see that, that, that big bowl of jalapeno bacon mac and cheese is quickly dwindling and you're hoping that it's still left when you get there. Or, or as you look at your finances and you're worrying that there's going to be too much month at the end of your money. Or th this, is, this is not the sort of kingdom which Jesus is inaugurating. He has come to bring abundance to his people, abundant life, that and plenty. Jesus came to feast with a cleansed Israel. He's been cleansing her through the casting out of demons and the healings and feasting with her. We've seen it a number of times in ever-growing waves of glory, cleansing followed by feasting. Jairus' daughter is resurrected, and Jesus commands a feast. The disciples have been sent out into all of Israel with a miniature great commission. And they come back reporting that the demons fled before them. And now he feasts with a great multitude of the harvest. But there's quite an important point here. We know that God saves sinners and often does so with a night and day change. I hope you all know someone or maybe yourself who was, was a hardened sinner, hardened towards God, and God, by his grace, opened their eyes, and they were soundly converted, and you see a, a, a glorious change in their life almost overnight. They had been an angry or hard or harsh person, and suddenly there, there's a softness and a tenderness and a, and a compassion in their life. There's a joy in their life. And that is wonderful to see indeed, but, but while the initial joy of seeing the change in a person, which conversion brings about, is indeed marvelous, there's a lesson here in this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which shows us the sort of king which Jesus is. Jesus, the sanctifying works of Jesus by his spirit often starts small. It starts imperceptibly. It looks like faithfully and lovingly disciplining your little toddler so they become a valiant man or virtuous woman. You parents, as you're raising your kids and, and you're teaching them to not fuss, you're teaching them to be content when they're 45 years old. You're, you're giving them small lessons, and you might have to repeat them over and over and over and over and over again. But these diligent, this diligence to teach them faithfulness in these young years is going to reap a harvest. As you faithfully teach them Christ and give them Christ and impart Christ to them and the virtues of Christ's spirit in them, you're teaching them to be godly men and virtuous women. Your, your young boys, when they come to you in the afternoon and they complain that they're hungry, if you just give in to them and teach them, oh, it's fine, here, here, go have a snack, go eat a bag of Doritos, you'll be fine. You're teaching them to be indulgent of their earthly 
passions. And when they're 20 or 25, that's going to come back to bite you, come back to haunt you. But if you teach them diligence, uh, and if you teach them to subdue their, uh, their cravings for an afternoon snack, you're teaching them to resist their carnal desires. And these, these sanctifying graces and virtues that you are planting in their lives in their early years will grow to be great godliness and faithfulness in their lives and their families and in their generation down the line. And this is the work which Jesus does. It starts small and it grows. Or think of your battle with, with sin. The work that Jesus does in our lives, yes, it's remarkable when there's a great conversion, we see a night and day difference, but that in some respects is just the beginning of the Christian life. This work of Jesus looks like, by God's grace, going a day, and then a week, and then a month, and then a year without looking at porn, or giving in to that besetting sin which so easily entangles you. This work of Jesus looks like mortifying a sin that you struggle with, mortifying it once, and then twice, and then a dozen times, and then discovering over time by God's great grace and the work of Jesus in you and his spirit in you is that over time that particular sin has lost its allure for you. Not that you don't have any temptations, but that that temptation, by his grace, you are faithfully overcoming by his strength. What starts small you might have said, I just failed in that sin yesterday. But God, the work that Jesus does is start small and over time it grows to consume the whole life and feed a whole multitude so that when he appears, we're told, we will appear like him. He is working in us, sanctifying us that we might be holy as he is holy. As Jesus brings his kingdom, it always starts small, only to grow in abundant glory. And so then, on to the next episode. Jesus walking upon the water is often taken as a demonstration of his divine power. A lot of times preachers will point to it as Jesus revealing that he is God. And while it does, of course, demonstrate God's divine power, we should note that God has always, had, al had already told Israel and revealed to Israel that he had been revealing his power and Godhead in both the created order and by the writings of the holy prophets. Uh, God, Yahweh, was the, the Lord over the seas. They knew that. And so rather than this being a depiction of Jesus displaying God's power, I think what we ought to see it as is Jesus in this wondrous act of striding over the sea like, the, like a Lord, surveying his realm. It demonstrates not, not so much Jesus' uh, divine nature, but Jesus to be himself Israel's long-awaited Messiah. And I'll show why. God put Adam in a garden to dress and to keep it and gave him the entire earth as the domain for him to subdue. And what has Jesus just done? Jesus has just compressed an entire agricultural season into an afternoon. He takes a loaf of bread and he plants it with his blessing and it produces, he waters it and it turns into a harvest a thousandfold in a matter of an hour. He plants the seed, waters it, and reaps the harvest in a matter of an afternoon. He is the great, the greater Adam. He's compressed an entire agricultural season into an evening. And then in the taming of the wind-swept seas, he compresses an entire meteorological uh, <laughs> uh, system. He says, that's enough for that storm. And compresses an entire meteorological storm into a moment. The wind has arisen and he tames it. Well, we're told that this is what man was supposed to be. This is what Adam was supposed to be. In Psalm 8, and we even, we even heard it earlier in one of the scripture readings, Genesis 9, Noah comes out and he's given a dominion over, over what? Over the beasts of the earth and the fowls of the air and the birds in the sea. Or the, the birds in the sea, the ducks. The fish of the sea and the ducks too. But this, this is what man was supposed to be. This is man as he ought to be. In Psalm 8, thou madest him, man, Adam, to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. 
And consequently, as a side note, that, I would make the case that's why there's fish included in the, um, in the five loaves and two fish, to call our minds back to this. They've got baskets of bread and fish in their boat, 12 of them. The fowl of the air and the, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea, man was to have dominion over. O Lord, our Lord, indeed, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Jesus is what Adam ought to have been. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods, as a later psalm says. Therefore, Jesus, in this miracle, is making way for man through him, through the Messiah, to be restored to our high office of lords of the earth under God our creator with Jesus Christ as the high king over all high kings. But we must not miss the pathway to this restoration. It's not just um, work harder at it. It's not just gain, uh, gain political power and bring it about. This, it's not to go to some mystic retreat and uh, repeat some mantra and, and smoke a lot of uh, things. <laughs> this is not the way to, to be restored to this new life. This new life which Jesus is ushering in. The way to this new life, this pathway that Jesus is giving, he, he reveals to us the pathway to this new life. The new life which Jesus is bringing into the world is found in those glorious words that he speaks to his disciples as he enters into their boat. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. It is found in the good tidings which are found in him alone where fear is cast out, the fear that there might not be enough, the fear that you might be left on the outs, he comes and he says, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And so lastly, Jesus brings his disciples through the sea once more, and he lands on the further side, for he is the true man, exercising dominion over land and sea, crops and oceans. Mark gives us one last wonderful parallel with the Red Sea crossing. Again, Mark wants this in our minds. As Moses led the delivered multitudes of Israel towards Sinai, they came to the bitter waters of Marah, and many fell ill due to the, the bitterness of the waters. And then Moses, remember, he heals those foul waters with a tree. Well, Jesus has come, Christ has come, to be our healer, to heal us through his work upon the tree. Now this greater Moses is revealed to be in this, this burst of healing ministry in Jesus' ministry, in Jesus' life. There's this wildfire effect where the, the grocery stores are replaced with hospitals and everyone who touches him is made whole. Jehovah Rapha has come in the flesh. The Lord, our healer, is in their midst. And this, we'll see when we get to chapter 7, this blow up of Jesus' healing ministry is quite controversial to the Pharisees. This greater Moses is revealed to be Jehovah Rapha in the flesh. He shows that he has come to make us whole. All who come to him, he makes whole. And why? Why does he make us whole? How does he make us whole? Well, because he came to cleanse and he came to feast. And Mark is giving us the faint outlines. I hope you can see it. The faint outlines of the Christian sacraments. He's come to cleanse us, drive out the demons, and restore our, our earthly body. He's proclaimed his word to us to cleanse us with his own word. And then he summons us to a feast. He summons us to partake of him and with him. He has come. How can he make you whole? How can you be assured that in him is the abundant life that is needed, that everything you need, as Peter says, for life and godliness is supplied in him? How can you be so sure? Well, because he came to cleanse and he came to feast. Jesus calls you to come to him in faith and be clothed in his righteousness. And this is what your baptism is. It is his cleansing of your life. And then he invites all the earth to this table. He says, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. He says, come to this feast, and there's plenty left over. N none who come to him will be cast out. He invites all the earth to this table, and lest you think that there won't be enough for you, Jesus, in his word, makes a point to tell you, and the disciples missed it, remember. They didn't learn the lesson of the loaves. But Jesus makes a point to assure you that all of this is held out for you. Will you be receptive of his word? 
Jesus, in his word, makes a point to tell you there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Father, we thank you for the abundant life that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would give us grace to, by faith, receive his word and so be cleansed by it, that we might partake of it with clear consciences. We might rejoice in the kingdom feast which Christ inaugurated for us in his life, death, burial, his ascension, and his sending forth of his spirit. We thank you for the revelation of Christ's glory, and we pray that you would give us a greater sense of this as we go throughout our week. And so, Father, we pray back to you the words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, This meal is a proclamation, an announcement. Paul said so. In the words of institution, it says, When we eat and drink, we show, we proclaim the Lord's death. It's like a trumpet blast that echoes throughout the cosmos. We declare the death of our Lord and Master. We point to the table and we say, His body was broken like that bread is. And see that wine? It's his blood. And then we eat it and we drink it. The early church was accused of cannibalism, and that isn't as strange an accusation as it first appears. The world understands honoring the death of a great man and using the imagery of broken bread and poured out wine for that remembering. Well, that's as good as any other. But when the saints eat the bread and drink the wine, we are saying more than just remember. We are saying that his Death is to us the stuff of life, that his death is cause for joy. And this is odd. In the sound of chewing and sipping can be heard the whisper of the word resurrection. And that whisper is amplified in our faithful works and in our songs and in our prayers as we go out from here until the whole body of the saints reverberates with the music of resurrection. When you eat and drink, here at this table. We do so until he comes. We do so in Christian hope. And as such, you are eating and drinking courage. Christian hope is not the same as a sunny disposition or positive vibes. Rather, it is forged on the anvil of historical event, tempered and tested by suffering and death, cooled in the grave, and now bright and sharp and put into your hand for war. We hold up our bread, in the hope of Christ's return. We hold up our wine in certain expectation of his final victory because we are certain of his past victory. We eat and drink courage, and we proclaim his death. We show his death until he comes. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you humble thanks and joyful praise for the gift of this meal given for the furthering of our faith and the strengthening of our hands. Thank you for ministering to us by it. Work by means of this bread and wine your purposes in us. Fit us for your service by this meal we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text took place in springtime, and so let me charge you with this. As you get your own gardens ready, take a moment, gather your family around, and just hold a seed in your hand. And think about the fact, remember that the work of Christ in you might start that small. But that is not the end. That's not how Jesus has told us his work in our life ends. It doesn't end as a seed. His work in you, he can turn that seed into enough and more than enough, enough food for a whole multitude. In Christ, small seeds of confession of sin. Each of us, as we confess our sin, one to each other, one, one, one to each other, and to, to the Lord, uh, when we, when we sin, he turns these small seeds of confession of sin and turns them into great harvests of cultural reformation. And so here with believing hearts and open hands, the benediction of God our Father. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And amen. Amen.